All right. So, what is a nonce? Okay, in what way? Um, it's, it's a variable that changes, that can change with time. Okay, what kind of variable? It's an integer. And it's it a number. It has to be greater than every previous, it has to be greater than the previous nonce. It's an integer that must be greater than the nonce associated with the previous request. And what do we need them for? What's the purpose? The hash value that it generates more random. Okay, so Nick had mentioned that you know it kind of increases the security, it makes it you know more random. If we're generating that hash value with a different nonce each time, the chance of getting the same hash multiple times is low. Okay, what else? What are the reasons is a is a nonce good? Lately, we've been talking about API stuff, right? And what are these APIs? They're communication protocols for us to connect into a uh, um, a third party's data source and pull information out. Now, typically, if we, you know, like for instance, last time we created an API key for Coinbase, right? And when we create that, we're probably going to plug that into some software. And that software is going to be pulling data down. Now, generating a nonce using a single API key, what will that, will that allow us to be pulling information from two different sources at the same time? If we use one key, if we generate one API key with uh, Coinbase, and then we write an application, and this application is pulling data from, uh, maybe it's pulling our balance from Coinbase every 30 seconds. Could we have another program someplace else using that exact same API key pulling our uh, balance as well? Why not? What, a, what specifically about the nonce makes that problematic? Okay, well, where do we typically get nonces? What's the what's a common value for a nonce? It's the time. time, number of seconds since 1970. Um, okay, so let's say that you wanted to have a program that uses the same API key that pulls a balance every 30 seconds ish, um, and you wanted to have it running from multiple locations. The downside by default would be that you cannot necessarily guarantee that the nonce will be greater with each call, correct? You might have some conflicts. Now, if both of those guys are using a local function for getting the number of seconds since 1970, chances are it should be greater than the previous call, correct? But there could be conflict. How can we avoid that conflict? We definitely don't want to have an application that crashes sometimes, you know, just because of bad luck. So how can we avoid that conflict? Well, I mean, it seems like that might even be a bigger problem. If you have it starting at one, and let's say I'm one of the sources that's requesting information, you're another one, and I get up to three, and you happen to be at four, yeah. so you request four, then all of a sudden I request four the next time around, it's going to fail because my nonce isn't larger than the last request. Do you think you have like a web server to move through your the nonce? And okay. So the source of the nonce becomes a bigger issue, right? So maybe we have a centralized server that we have to have each of our applications say, give me at the next nonce. And that guy's job is to hand out nonces that make sure that they're in ascending order. Okay. Or we could just create more than one API key. Make sense? 
So the nonce adds a level of variability and a, an additional level of security to API calls. Make sense? Okay. All right, so last time, let me open up our Eclipse if I don't already have it open. Okay, last time we had written some code uh, that requires... Uh, expand this and see what, okay. We had written some code that takes our uh, URL, opens it up, actually we wrote this two times ago, but we were talking about some other things last time, um, and ultimately spits it out. I think this is just US dollars to euros, or US dollars to Bitcoin and vice versa, right? Now, I've already put up a homework assignment, so your next homework assignment, just for you to... Uh, see real quick. Well, it, it's up on Angel. Basically, what I have you do is I want you to uh, first create an API key on Coinbase. All right, like we did last time in last class. Then I want you to write a program similar to this one. Not That's not going to use our API key yet. We're going to start working with that now. But a program similar to this that's going to use this Git URL. And your program, instead of outputting the conversion between Bitcoin and US dollar and US dollar and Bitcoin, it should show Bitcoin and euros, US dollar and euros. So just an extra little filter. So this will be your main and uh, this might be what your display method looks like, doctored up slightly to work for euros. Okay, so for completing your assignment, you have everything you need. Um, yeah, actually, we do create a bar. So here's the JSON bar code. The first couple minutes of this video should have all the code in it that you need to complete the assignment. You'll just make a couple of modifications here. That'll get you used to just writing some network Java stuff. You know, monkey see, monkey do. Just type in what I typed. But more importantly, you'll also have an API key created. And I want you to, along with a uh, screenshot of your code and a screenshot of your program running, I want you to submit your public API key only. Not the private one. The private one's supposed to stay private. Okay, Public one is proof you did it. I don't need to see your... Uh, I'm sorry, the public one is proof that you did it. I don't need to see the private one. If you gave me the private... I don't need to see your privates. If you gave me the private um, uh, API key, that would then allow me, if you ever went and created, actually had a bunch of Bitcoin in your Coinbase account, uh, that would allow me to write applications to manipulate your account. Does that make sense? So you never want to give out your private key. You can use it in your own software. And one of the features and that we're going to start looking at here, um, so just let me bounce back here to the screen. Uh, we started talking about this last time, but just while I'm on the subject, we're going to notice down here, we're going to have two variables, and we'll start messing with this today, where we have our public key, that's our API key, and then we're going to have our secret key, that's our private key. That's the one we don't want to share with anybody. So this is going to be in our program, hard-coded in here. So you definitely don't want to share your source code with anybody. But one thing we're going to notice, um, I won't walk down to it now, but one thing that we will notice is that when we do make our request to the server, uh, requesting our balance for our account, giving it our public key and, and the different credentials it needs from us, one thing we're going to see is we never actually send the secret key. We utilize the secret key locally here along with a nonce, along with the SHA-256 algorithm, to create a hash. And it's that hash that we sent. It was a hash that was built in part with our secret key. Does that make sense? So we're never actually sending your, the secret key. So maybe something to, uh, uh, whenever you're using any sort of public-private key encryption, um, uh, as well as working with APIs, which kind of those two go hand in hand. Usually we're using public and private keys to talk to the API securely without passing usernames and passwords around. It's kind of the point. Passing around your password is kind of a bad idea. Almost as bad as passing around private keys. But we can use private keys to do some other things. And hash has become a good tool for that since they're all one-way cipher. We can't go back the other direction. But a good rule of thumb would be 
never, ever, ever send your private key anywhere. Don't send it in an email. Um, now, I'm saying this from a, you know, a good security perspective. If this is some stupid private key for something and you're just working with documentation and you know, send it by email, it's fine, not a big deal. But if this is something real that's attached like a bank account or something like that or something that you actually care about the security, never email the private key, never write an application that sends the private key over the network. Okay, always do something with the private key first. So in this case, our private key will actually live inside of our source code. But that source code is going to get compiled down to Java bytecode, which is a low-level language associated with Java. With that in mind, is our private key secure? Not entirely. There are decompiler uh, pieces of software out there that can take Java bytecode and reverse it to get the original source code. So given that, it would also be a bad idea to email somebody, well, certainly the .java file, right? Oh, and that's gonna have the plain text version of your secret key in it, but also the .class file. The .class file could potentially, if an interested party decided to run one of the uh, decompilation programs on it, they could potentially then also get your secret key. So in this particular case, we are writing a program that we intend to run on our own physical hardware that only we have access to. This is not something we intend to send to somebody. Okay, if that makes sense? Um, good example is I have an application um, that I wrote that's on the uh, uh, Apple's App Store. And uh, in this application, it, it works with CEX. And in this application, you have to go into the app and you have to provide your public and your private key in the application uh, in order for it to work, in order for it to communicate with your account. And the disclaimer I have on there is that your private key is never sent over the network. It's read in locally to your phone, and that's the last place it ever exists. From that point forward, it's only used to generate hashes. Okay, so the security of that is um, the application is sitting on their phone, and that data is also physically sitting on their phone. So the only way somebody could possibly get their code is if somebody got physical access to their device. Knew that they had a private key on there, plugged it in, went and looked at the internal variables, decided to decompile stuff, and blah, 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 but they would still require physical access to the device because that information is never being set, sent externally from the application. So that's something to keep in mind when you deal with public private key uh, security. Public key's fine, you could post it on your Facebook page. That's the purpose. Purpose of the public key is, hey, if you want to communicate with me, this public key is the way we pull that off. Private key, don't put it anywhere. Make sense? Okay, so starting up top here, I think we were looking at the Apache thing last time, right? And we downloaded this file, 4.3.5 tar.gz. We call that a, a tarball, right? Kind of a funny name. The more modern ones are tgz, .tgz. They just, instead of two dots, it's one dot. All right, so once we downloaded that, it created a folder for us that looks like this. HTTP components, client, blah, blah, blah. And inside of this folder, we have a folder called lib. And inside the lib folder, we have a whole bunch of things with .jar on the end of it. A jar file is a Java archive. So this is how external Java libraries are distributed. Now up to this point, for those of you who, um, well even, I mean, those of you who are 250 have been exposed to Java at a very small, you know, small level, but even those of you who have had Java for several semesters, you probably have not been exposed to connecting external libraries to your Java program. So who in here has ever connected an external library to uh, a Java program, just a couple people, right? And it's usually for very specialized purposes because Java being a general purpose language already has a bunch of crap built into it, right? But sometimes you need a third party tool for accomplishing special tasks. We're gonna look at a couple of them in here. This first one is using Apache for the security stuff. When Java was invented, when it first came out, um, SHA-256 did not exist. 
Now, since Java first came out, there's been eight versions of the Java software um, development kit, Java SDK. And with each new version, the new version becomes a superset of the previous version. So most stuff from the previous version still exists. Sometimes when you look at the documentation, you may see that a certain function or a certain method may be deprecated. Have we seen that before? The word deprecated? Deprecated means we're getting rid of this, it will still work, but you might want to avoid using this in your future applications because at some point it will stop functioning. That's what deprecated means. Usually when they deprecate something, they have replaced it with something else that might be more secure or something like that. So that's one word to look for when you're looking at the Java documentation to see if something has become de uh, deprecated. But more importantly for our, this discussion is as new versions of Java come out, they sometimes incorporate things that have become commonplace in Java programs. So for example, when the next version of Java comes out, Java 9, it would not necessarily surprise me if some of this uh, SHA-256 and HTTP communication stuff gets pulled into it because it's become commonplace in application development today. Uh, I mean, we've talked about it with Bitcoin. We're seeing it with APIs, and this isn't the only API that deals with it. You know, most APIs that you work with are going to use the SHA-256 hash in, you know, in some way. So that's become fairly commonplace for all sorts of applications because pretty much all modern day apps are going to deal with some sort of internet connectivity, right? You know, the internet just becomes the core of everything. It's just how we communicate now. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if some of these things become a uh, part of the Java uh, core language. But for right now, if we need access to these, we either A, have to write our own implementation of it or B, rely on a third-party implementation of it. Sometimes those third-party implementations are made by legitimate organizations. For instance, this particular one we're pulling from Apache, which is, you know, we'll call them legit. Apache is like, you know, would be on the same level as like, as like Microsoft and Apple in terms of the web server world, okay? We're gonna be looking at something else um, before long. Uh, we've written our own little implementation of JSON and we'll use that as much as we can. But as an example, there are plenty of third-party versions of JSON libraries for working in, uh, uh, in Java. One's called Simple JSON. That's the one I usually recommend to people because the Java, um, uh, the Java software development kit for the standard one does not have JSON built into it. Their enterprise version does, but their standard one does not. I bet you in the next version of the standard one, standard one it might because JSON has become very commonplace. But for right now, we either A, have to choose to write our own library, or B, bring another library in. Well, we wrote our own because JSON is actually fairly simple, and most of the JSON we're going to be working with here is simplified JSON. Uh, but JSON, since it supports arrays and some other things, can become very complex. And in that case, if your goal is to work with the JSON rather than reinvent the wheel, you might choose to use a library that the forums say, hey, yeah, we've used this, it works, blah, 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 bug-free or relatively bug-free or whatever. So instead of you spending two days writing your own foolproof JSON parsing library, you could just use somebody else's tool where they've already put the work in. Kind of make sense? But this is how we're going to accomplish this in Java. So sometimes you have to download third-party applications. But it is fairly rare. It's going to come down to when we actually write our application, is there a need for connecting to something that's not just built into the Java language, okay? So in this case, we've decided, well, we need this HTTP client crap for making our connection because that's going to allow us to build the correct type of post requests and get requests that allow us to package with it some of these credentials that aren't kind of built into the normal uh, you know, socket communication stuff that's built into Java by default. So in any case, we have this jar, these list of jars, and I don't know which, in, which is in each of these, but we can actually unzip these if we were interested. Not important. This is just, this is how third-party places can distribute their own libraries. So if you wanted to package up our uh, um, JSON parser that we wrote, you can turn it into a jar and distribute it and say, this is an awesome, somewhat working JSON parser for free or charge 99 cents for it or whatever you want to do. I wouldn't charge 99 cents for it. I would charge 10 bucks for it. 
people have the perception that's extra good then. No returns. Okay, so we have all these jar files. Now, for starters, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into our example here. So this is the Coinbase API site again. And this is giving us an example of how do we work with the balance. Okay? So we're going to start off with this import, all these import statements up here. I'll highlight, excuse me, I'll highlight those. I'll go into our driver program for starters. Put a couple spaces in there and I'll paste all that in. And you're going to see that several things were already built into Java, but a couple of things were not. So all this org.apache crap, it's never heard of. That isn't part of the core Java language. Does that make sense? All right. So we need to let Java know about this. We need to let, well, we need to let the Java runtime environment know about these libraries. So we need to connect these libraries some way to our particular project. So what we're going to do in Eclipse is we're going to come into, is, is this within 390, that one? Yeah, that's the right thing. Okay, so we're going to come in here and we're going to go ahead and right click on our project over here. And I think it's in build path. Yep, build path. We're going to do configure build path. Okay. And let's see. We're going to go to libraries up here. And one of our options is add external jars. So we'll click on that. Now it's going to want us to browse to that. I have already browsed there. So you'll notice this is in downloads, HTTP components, lib. And here's all those jar files. Now we might not actually need all of those for this particular project, but I'm not sure which library is in which. So just for the sake of quickness, we're going to go ahead and we're going to include all of those Java archives into our project. Okay. Go ahead and hit open. So now all of these things are now part of our project. We'll hit OK. We'll see we have a new folder thing that gets created here called referenced libraries. And all these guys are in here. You'll also notice that now it knows about the org crap. No more red underlines. Make sense? OK. Now, we are going to just for starters here. I'm just going to go ahead and comment out all of our stuff so we can run their little test code and see how it works. So we'll go back here and I'm going to steal all their code here that's in this Coinbase example. And we'll walk through it over here because it'll be cleaned up in some reasonable way, hopefully. Uh, for right now, I'm going to Oh, they wrote this as a function. So here, I'll just do that. I'm going to make these guys global variables. We'll fill them in here shortly. Then I'll take this method and we'll put it outside of main and we'll just call it from within main. Post that function. Okay. And then just real quickly, should need one more closing. Okay. Let me just tell it to fix the indentation and see if it cleans anything up for us. Doesn't really matter. I'll fix it as we go through. Okay. So as of right now, all our main does is it prints out a call to our function, which should be driver.getHttp, and we're going to pass it 
that we want balance. We're going to call that version of our API, okay, for Coinbase. The second parameter there is this thing called body. We're just going to pass it nothing. We're just writing their little example code. All right, so we're going to walk through this and see how their code works. So name of their function they wrote here is called get HTTP that takes in a URL, and that, which is going to be pretty similar to what we did here with our JSON parser. Where we passed in, actually, hold on, not our JSON parser. It's going to be similar to what we did up here, where we created a URL, we opened up a URL connection, we read it in with our scanner, and then passed the resulting JSON to our uh, JSON parser. But they are using some tools that allow it to um, allow us to pass our uh, hash functions along with it. Okay, for that request. So the nonce. They're getting system.currentTime in milliseconds. That's a function um, that's built into Java. It's built into the system class in Java. And it will give us the current number of seconds uh, since uh, uh, 1970. And this will give us the string value of that. Uh, we could have also just concatenated on the empty string, but this is what their code currently does. Okay. Then we're going to get our message. So we're going to create our message. This is the um, uh, this is the thing that we need to um, you. This is what we initially need to create before we create our hash. So our message here is going to be the nonce, along with whatever the URL is. In this case, the URL is going to be Coinbase.com/API/v1/account/balance, concatenated with the body, um, if the body is null, then uh, return the empty string. If it's not null, then return the body. I know some of you have seen this before. If you're in 250, you haven't. But what's this guy called? What kind of what kind of animal is this? Who has seen this syntax before? Several of you should have your hands up. You should have your hand 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 up. Can Both of you should have your hand up. Can we, can we see it like once? Because I don't remember the question mark. You should not have your hand up. You should never have your hand up. Uh. This is actually a throwback from older languages like C and C++. It's called an inline if statement. Inline if statement. The syntax for this is this. It's Boolean expression followed by question mark followed by True expression, colon, false expression. So this allows us to have a, basically an if statement that is in line with something else. So if this Boolean expression is true, boil down to whatever's here. If it's false, boil down to what's ever here. So this is our Boolean expression here, body not equal to null. I've shown it to you. I'm positive. 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 Oh, I'm definitely positive. Yeah, but one. you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> really? You really don't think you showed us? What are the Not chances that maybe you just weren't paying attention? The, the 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 breadth of knowledge that flows out of you on a daily basis. <laughs> what are the chances? One can only absorb so much. What are the chances that none of us remember it? Hi. <laughs> 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 uh, Wait, hold on. Like, no, we did do the abstract. We did, yeah. but Voltage. when we originally first right. You've started, seen this before. Have, we did abstract, I know that. Have you seen this before? I do not recall that, no. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> Vice? Nope. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. I'm assuming I'm right. <laughs> so in any case, as a reminder for some of you, and for an initial lesson for the rest of you, Here's our Boolean expression that says, if the body is not equal to null, notice when we called it up here, we passed it a null value for our body. Whatever that means. You know, the body of the uh, URL, we're not actually using it here. So in this case, it will be true that it's null. So if body is not equal to null, for ours, that will be false, correct? Because body is equal to null. So since body is null for us, this Boolean expression will boil down to false. And we will boil down here then to our false expression, which is the empty string. 
If it were something other than null, then this would boil down to whatever it was. So in this case, what are we concatenating? We're concatenating our nonce, the URL, and in our specific case here, the empty string, because we didn't have a body. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, in any case, this is going to give us a new string made up of concatenating those pieces together. That's what message holds. All right. So, now that's an important type of thing, this inline if statement. You won't see it very often, but that's where it comes from. Okay, uh, it was really a popular thing in um, uh, old C languages. Uh, it could still be useful today in situations just like this, where we want one of two values kind of incorporated in. It's not kind of a full-fledged if statement. It kind of is a ask a question, boil down to this value or this value. You can't really have multiple lines in there. But nice little convenience line saves us an if statement, like if it's null, do this, else do this. Building messages, message two separate times. All right, so after this line, message holds a bunch of information concatenated together. Now we're going to create our MAC address. So MAC is going to come from, uh, I believe it is in this library. I can double check that here real quick. No, maybe not. Oh, that's the class. So it wouldn't be in there. Oh, you mean the one that actually says Mac? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's where exactly where it would be. Okay. <laughs> I was testing you. <laughs> but only the criminal spoke up. This is what happens when you get old. Crap like that. Uh, okay. So, anyways, we're going to create a variable of type Mac, name it Mac. And we're going to get an instance of HMAC SHA-256. So that's going to be an instance of that algorithm for creating a hash. And we haven't actually generated a hash yet. We just kind of have, we created for ourselves this instance of the tool that's capable of doing it. All right. Then we're going to initialize that tool with a new secret key spec using our Whatever our secret key is, which we're going to enter in up here, we haven't done it yet, we'll put ours in here in a minute, but whatever that guy ends up being, we're going to take that secret key and we're going to get the bytes associated with it, okay, because that guy's currently a string. We want the bytes associated with that string because that's what the input requires. We'll look at what that looks like here in a few minutes. Uh, and in fact, actually, just so we don't forget, let me go ahead and go into my Coinbase account. Here's my API key. That's my public key. That's the guy I want you to submit with your homework. Just that one, not the one below it. Okay. So we'll go ahead and we're going to fill this global variable up here called API key. We'll replace that with our actual API key. Then we're going to grab our secret key here and fill in our secret key. Okay, and just to see what this looks like right now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to print this out just so you can see what that looks like. So I'm going to comment out that line. We're going to say system.out.println secret key get bytes. That's what it looks like. What does that look like to you? Memory address. So what do you think bytes looks like? This is a string, correct? So get bytes is probably going to return for us an array. So we go to the Java documentation here. We'll go to string. We'll go to string more better. Right over there. We'll go down to get bytes. And this guy returns for us a byte array. So we got a pointer to that byte array. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to say 
byte array b is equal to this guy. and we'll print out all the bytes associated with that guy. So these are the bytes associated with our code. We'll notice our secret key, the very first character, was a lowercase s. That's where the 115 came from. So the lowercase char s when, and what, what kind of data type is a char? When you first learned about Java, char is actually stored as what kind of value? An integer. What size integer? Sixteen. Sixteen bit. Definitely not 32 bytes. Yeah, you meant bits. <laughs> And that is a big old number. <laughs> it's a 16-bit unsigned, 16-bit unsigned integer. And it's because it maps to the, what, what lookup table? Unicode. Unicode lookup table. So S, on the lowercase s on the Unicode lookup table, is equivalent to the integer 115, the byte, the byte primitive type 115. Okay, so when I printed this out, notice this loop right here goes through all the bytes that get bytes returned. The very first character in my API secret was a lowercase s. Its Unicode equivalent is 115. What I do at the very end here let's put a little spacer in. What I do at the very end here is I just print out the Unicode value of lowercase s. So the very first thing that prints out and the very last thing that prints out should be the same, proving that the byte, what get bytes returns, is a collection of all those Unicode integers. So there's our 115. That's the byte primitive type associated with a lowercase s. And then here's the byte primitive type associated with a lowercase s. So what does get bytes do for a string? It goes through every character in that string and returns the byte primitive type for its Unicode position. Make sense? That's what it does. It's a built-in function that does that. Okay, returns it for us in something called a byte array. So it's a collection of bytes and I just spun through and printed them all out. Now down here where that was being used, our secret key Spec requires a byte array as its first parameter, a collection of bytes associated with a secret key. That makes sense? So that's what this line is doing. And what specialization are we doing? We want it to be an HMAC SHA-256. So we want to prepare this guy with this collection of bytes using this algorithm. All right, so that's what that line does. Next line, we're going to create a string named signature. And that string is going to be a brand new string. We're going to use our hex class. We're going to encode in hexadecimal mac, which is our instance variable of type mac with a capital M, do final, which is a method, passing it the get bytes version of our message. So that's this guy up here. So this will be the same type of collection of bytes, but for a different value. This is the collection of bytes associated with our message as opposed to our secret key. All right, so something I'll bounce back to here that I've said many times before, all hard programs are made up of a bunch of easy parts. So when we're looking through this, this seems like really complex crap. But as we're walking through it one line at a time, each line, if we only stare at that one line, isn't really doing anything crazy. 
putting all these things together in a certain order is very mathy. You know, we're dealing with crazy bytes and bits and hash values and all this crap, but if we follow it one line at a time, we're just making a, making a lasagna. We're preparing each of the ingredients, right? And then we're putting them all together in an interesting way. So this guy right here is we're going to encode in hexadecimal the bytes associated with, and what I'm going to do here is, um, just to show you this, I'm going to take our message just so we can evaluate each of these things. I'll just copy our message up there. Um, actually, not really important here, but uh, here. That's an example of what our message might look like. That's a nonce followed by the URL followed by the empty string since our body was nothing. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this line up there, the signature. Which is going to hexadecimally encode. I need our Mac guy here too. So I'm just doing this up in main so we can just see what these lines do. So I built a message, fake little message, created our instance of Mac for SHA-256. Now we're going to encode whatever do final does for Mac, the get bytes version of our message. And then we'll print out signature. Mac is not initialized. So that should get the let's look at this real quick. Mac is in javax.crypto.mac. Let's look at that real quick. So it was in do final that screwed up. So let's look at javax.crypto. And here's Mac. Do final finishes the Mac operation on something, returns a byte array. Fine. Oh, here's the version of do final that takes a byte array as a parameter. Processes the given array of bytes and finishes the Mac operation. Okay, fair enough. So get instance. We pass it the string for our algorithm. That's what we're doing right here. We're saying Mac, get instance, passing it the algorithm we want. This should give us an instance of Mac stored in MAC. Then right here, we're saying Mac.doFinal, passing it a collection of bytes. And that's where it's bailing out. It's screaming at us saying, illegal state exception, Mac not initialized. Let me look at get instance real quick. Did we use, I wonder if it's case sensitive. Actually, what was the exception again real quick? 
legal state exception. I'll go back to the code real quick. Look at the line right under where Mac you uh down here? Yeah, one right Oh, 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 thank you. Thank you. We didn't finish initializing it. There we go. So there is the hexadecimal digest associated with our message. That's what this does. Yeah, we got the instance, but we didn't initialize the instance. I didn't steal enough code from below. All right, so we'll stop there. So at this point, we are at, we're through this line right here. So the next time we'll pick up It's already up on Angel, the okay. assignment. Just get this all set up pretty much. No, it has nothing to do with this. It's oh. what we've done in previous classes. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah, you're not doing the crazy stuff here. Okay. I'm just having you write a little Java program that connects to that get that exchange one okay. that we've written. So if you you can do the assignment by looking at how do you do, how do we generate our API key from last class? And then I showed you all the code you'll need for the assignment in the first couple of minutes of today's lecture on the video. Make sense? Yeah, you're not doing this crazy crap yet. Yeah, just monkey see, monkey do, type in that code and change US dollars to Euro for our for your example, just to manipulate the code a little bit. Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. I will see everybody on Wednesday.